Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fiscal Focus at Don News English. I'm Danish Khan. And today we're going to critically analyze the intersection of race and class in mediating unequal outcomes in the United States. To discuss this issue, I'm joined by Leanne Roncolato. She is Associate Professor of Economics at Franklin and Marshall College. Previously, she has worked with the International Labor Organization in Geneva. Leanne is also one of the associate editors of the journal called Feminist Economics. Thank you, Leanne, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. This is great. Now, economists often argue that markets allocate resources efficiently, and therefore there's not much room for race or gender in economic analysis. How would you respond to this approach? Yeah, so there is a growing field called stratification economics. Um, William Darity, Derek Hamilton, and many others are working to develop this further. But one of the arguments that's really key to their to this work in stratification economics is to look at the ways in which there's actually material incentives on the part of the group that is currently advantaged to perpetuate inequality and to stay in power. Um, that actually markets don't move us towards equal distribution of resources, but actually there's real incentives to try to maintain inequality. Um, and the incentives to maintain inequality may be along, in the United States, is largely along the lines of race, but we can also think that along the lines of um, gender as well. Yes, and especially in the case of U.S., the race remains ever present in analysis or in society when you look at the socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, so can we understand inequality solely via class lens or there has to be an intersectional approach of class and race? Yeah, so I think in most countries, right, you can think about intersections of class with race, ethnicity, other identity groups. But particularly in the United States, there's a very strong story in which our system of capitalism is intertwined with a history of racism. And so so the one of the things I wanted to say on the outset, so I teach race and inequality. I also teach a social activism class. And um, my own research is has been more around sexual orientation and gender with little bits of race here and there. But the work that has really influenced my understanding of this is um, Ibram X. Kendi's work, um, both his his earlier work, Stamp from the Beginning, and um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and Heather McGee's work on um, called The Sum of Us, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Also, Michelle Alexander's work. I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Michelle Alexander's work, um, The New Jim Crow, and a lot of um, Ava Duvern DuVernay's um, documentaries, particularly The 13th, have all really influenced how I think about this. So just to give appropriate references from the out front. But to look at, so to go back to your question, the history of the United States, we cannot tell our history of economic development and our history of, of economic growth without thinking about racial inequality, without thinking about racism and acknowledging the racial exploitation that has happened along the way. In the South, um, during slavery was a critical part of how um, the South grew and economically developed. And we needed at the time, people needed a moral justification for to continue to exploit slaves um, and to have people as enslaved people. Um, and so that moral justification came through racism and uh, Christianity <laughs> played a role in that as well. Um, and so to, to uh, in the process of dehumanization, of saying um, this group of people, because of their skin tone, because of literally the amount of melanin they have in their skin, are less than, are not fully human. And so um, that was our beginning, right? And that is the part of our core story of what America's beginning was. But it didn't end with slavery. When, um, when slavery ended, we came up with more, a new system, right? Um, and the new system was largely like one of the big strategies was about criminalizing um, and othering the black body. Continuing to criminalize black bodies is a way of continuing to dehumanize and and use them for, for economic exploitation. And so this is where we start to see the beginnings of the um, prison industrial complex in the United States and the mass incarceration of um, particularly black men, but also um, other men of color um, in the and women of color in the United States. Yes, I mean, that 
history is, is critically important and it tends to reproduce over time, especially those institutional uh, structures. Now, there are obvious moral and ethical criticisms of racism and they can be derived from a uh, wide range of philosophical viewpoints. But as an economist, uh, what is often less highlighted is what are the economic costs of slavery or racism in particular uh, and other forms of discrimination. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So the, the first thing I'll, I'll talk about in a contemporary sense, right? In a contemporary sense, when we have discrimination of any kind, whether it's gender discrimination, sexual oriented discrimination, um, race discrimination, if we think in, honestly in like purely neoclassical mainstream economic models, that is not allowing us to optimize our human, ca human capital potential in our economy, right? So by creating these barriers of who has access to what jobs, who has access to promotions, the way in which promotions happen, um, the way in which occupational segregation happens about who gets into which careers and why, we are not that is not the most efficient allocation of our resources in the economy. So it is preventing us from um, being able to reach our full potential, right? So um, the, I don't know, the the document, or it's not a documentary, it's the movie Million Miles Away, which is about a true story of um, the first Latino man to make it to, was an astronaut. Like, it's a great story. And I wish that like, that is more of the American dream story we see, but the truth is it's an exception, right? The reality is that um, people of color, low-income folks, folks with disabilities have barriers in our country to access the full potential of the jobs that are available. And so because of whichever, if there's like a neurodiversity issue, if there's a race issue, if there's a uh, um, where you grew up in your town and doesn't have the appropriate resources, we're not allowing the folks that are the most gifted, right, to to fill, fulfill the jobs that they should, right? So that is not good economically, right? Um, so that's the first thing I would say. Do you want, is that? Yeah, sense? I mean, I I, you mentioned movie. I don't know if you watched The Long Game, which is about how uh, a high school team, uh, Lati uh, Latino students in a Texas school were not allowed to play golf, right? Because the okay. golf was only reserved for some races, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, so it's a, it's a brilliant movie and it also shows how you know, so individuals making different, doing activism and taking bold steps. You talked about the different aspects not having optimal outcomes because we start with uneven playing field, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but then if we have a level playing field, then markets may lead to optimal outcomes, right? But if we start with unequal playing field, which is almost true for every society, and especially in the case of U.S., then there there needs to be some sort of uh, intervention, whether it's at a community level or government or or, or uh, nonprofit sector, whichever. So we need some sort of intervention. But we see in the case of the U.S., the role of government has been steadily declining, especially in the case of public goods. And John Kenneth Galbraith has been talking about this. I mean, his work and other institutional economists that the provision of public goods is central for economic growth and sustainability. But there's a huge decline of public goods. And is it tied to racism in America or are there some other factors at play here? Yeah, so this is one of the main arguments in Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us. Um, she uses this really important analogy, but which was also a reality of the draining of the swimming pools um, during the period of desegregation in the United States. And so what, sh what this um, book looks at is how post-World War II in the United States, we had a lot of investment in public goods, right? We had investment in schools, that were um, publicly funded. We had investment in infrastructure and in roads in swimming pools and public parks. Um, people were like, this is great. We're totally on board with this. And by people, <laughs> it was white people were totally on board with this um, because during this period of time, this is still where there was a lot of segregation in the United States, both formal, both legally sanctioned and informal segregation. Um, this is still the period of redlining in the United States where there's, um, certain where lending practices were completely segregating cities and neighborhoods across the country. 
And so she, while this is, these public goods are reserved for white people, everyone was on board with it. And by everyone, I mean white people were on board with it. Not everybody was on board with it. Um, then we have the period of the civil rights movement and desegregation, where it was no longer legal to have a separate black swimming pool and white swimming pool. It was no longer legal to have schools for just black children and just white children. And um, during that period of time is where we saw, um, and she documents this attitude of no longer wanting to invest in public goods. And so there were cities and, and counties and, and uh, communities across the country in the United States during this period of time that said, if we have to desegregate this pool, right, if we have to have um, black and white and brown kids swimming together, we'd rather not have a pool at all, right? And so she makes the argument that this, this racist idea, right, the, the racist attitude of not wanting to share the public goods means that the public goods were taken away from everyone. Right. So not only did black children no longer have swimming pools to swim in, the white children also had no had pools to swim in. Um, and so she looks at this this during this period of time where we saw this closing down of public pools in the United States. This also coincides with a defunding of um, not just um, primary and secondary schools, but also pulling back funding from colleges and universities. One of the assumptions um, that's often made, I mean, you and I are at a liberal arts college, everyone was talks about the cost of colleges going up in the United States and the assumptions that somehow like the food's better, or there's like administrative bloat or like fancy services. The reality is, is public funding for even private schools like small liberal arts colleges has completely been pulled back in the last 30 years. And so, um, which explains, which is the big driver of the increase in costs. And so she's making the argument here that be because people don't want to share, <laughs> everyone gets screwed over, right? The, the cost of racism has actually been, it's been highest for Blacks and, and Brown people in the United States, but it is also, there is a real cost that whites have played in the United States. And this is, even Max Kendi makes this argument very clearly in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, that when we talk about our system of white supremacy, it is not benefiting the majority of whites, mm -hmm. right? Our system of white supremacy in the United States benefits a very, very, very small elite, right? A very, very wealthy white people. For like when we think about like the Koch brothers and that the enterprise of um, that actually that's about what they believe in is property supremacy that they're trying it's about wealth accumulation but they're using racism they're using racist ideas in order to maintain their power right in order to get more power and more wealth um, and so the yeah so the argument is like the the system of white supremacy and very very wealthy white elites would like us to stay divided. It is in their interest for, to, for us to stay divided. But for the majority of Americans, if we all collectively decided to go back to investing in public goods, we would all, most of us would be made better off, right? The fraction of a percent would be worse off, but most of us would be better off by that. So uh, Fascinating. This is, a, this is a great insight. So you're saying racism does not just hurt people of color, which of course, there's a lot of brutality um, faced by especially black men in this country, but also everyone else is being negatively impacted because the way public policy has been restructured in order to make sure that uh, public goods are not used by everyone. So, but legally we cannot do that anymore, right? Law says everyone oh, has yeah. equal access. So why not just cut back on public goods? So that, that, that's a very interesting argument. But then an economist may come back and say that, oh, well, this is broadly tied with, you know, neoliberal ideology and philosophy where the role of government seems to be problematic and we have a deficit problem. So it doesn't have to do anything with race. It's just an economic policy. How would you respond to that? I mean, I yeah, so there's a couple parts of that that I would respond to. I think the first part is that looking at the ways in which our attitudes toward the U.S. attitudes towards government funding mm -hmm. is tied to racist ideas. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, now I can't remember which book this is. It may actually be in the documentary, the 13th, but like that one of the Republican strategies was instead of specifically 
saying like instead of specifically say negative things about black people in the United States of using coded language. Um, and one of the ways they use the coded language is this idea of like criticizing the welfare queens, right? So there's been a bunch of racist tropes that have been used um, in order to get people to pull back from the idea of government support, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so then people's concerns are like, well, I don't want that black person to get public funding. And so that in general is going to lower attitudes towards public funding overall. Um, so that actually, um, and similar things like with, with Medicare yes. and Medicaid and, and yes. those kind of public services, making, <laughs> making people think that it's the other person who's yes. getting that you yourself would not benefit. And so this process, this process of othering and creating these divisive ideas, um, this is also like part of um, the decline in unions in the United States yeah. of wanting, not wanting workers to be united, right? It is in the interest of capitalists, it's in the interest of those in power to not have workers be united. And so one way that you can divide workers is by trying to divide them along, along lines of race. Yes. And ethnicity, right? And so that is a strategy that's actually used um, in order to to defund things. <laughs> and yeah, no, yeah, and in, in that Heather McGee book that you you referred to me, right? There she talks about the numbers where in 1950s and early 60s there was a huge support for public goods among white population in America, yeah. including white men. But that post civil rights uh, that support has been declined. So this is this is there's a fascinating correlation here that yeah. the support for public goods decline as American society, legally speaking, become more inclusive towards everyone. So yeah. now there's a great story, underlying story here that is the solidarity across race lines, right? So that then it becomes not the question of solely racism, but it's white working class brown working class people everybody uh, who's who's not entitled in terms of uh wealth is being disadvantaged so what yeah. kind of policy solutions we can uh foresee to make america more inclusive yeah i mean i think one of it's interesting cuz the the conclusion the last chapter of her book where she's largely focusing on issues of um throughout it of us born black experience right and like history of but then the last chapter is this big discussion over immigration and what does it mean when when towns quickly diversify because of immigration um and i think one of i mean this is obviously super pertinent in our country right now it's like big part of the um the debates between um harris and trump but i think if we just take an example of immigration issues right um, the narrative that conservatives and those interested in maintaining, in particularly like if we think even more narrowly, not like working class conservatives, but the this very small elite that I was referring to, right, who have a lot of power and money, um, they would like to use the issue of immigration to keep workers divided in the United States. That is what is happening, right? And racist ideas about immigration in particular to keep um, workers divided. And um, like, even at the beginning, like one of the things that the, this is a bit of a tangent, but at the beginning of the uh, presidential debate, when Trump talks about black jobs, like he is um, Im- immediately trying to think about pitting immigrant workers against black workers without even acknowledging, like, what do you, like, uh, like it'd be nice to like push back a little bit, like, what do you mean by black jobs, <laughs> right? And what, he, what he'd like to say is the ways in which we've exploited blacks over, uh, <laughs> over centuries. Um, but so the incentive is, that that's the story they want America's, America to take. They wanna say, divide, 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 immigrants are going to come take our jobs, et cetera, right? When if we look at um, the economics of this, and again, like any kind of morality thing aside, okay, if we just look at the economics of immigration um, and and look at neoclassical mainstream models of immigration, right? When we have an influx of labor, right? Labor is part of our production function. It leads to higher economic growth. It is a, it is a plus, it is a resource. Um, 
And when we look at cases of towns and like, yes, there is certainly um, an adjustment period that towns and cities need to go through when there's an influx of new people. And there's an infrastructure question that needs to be solved. There's a school issue that needs to be solved. But from the economics in the long run is this creates economic growth, right? Immigrants having more people wherever they're from, right? Whether they're from Mexico or England and Australia or it's in Pennsylvania and they're coming from Ohio, regardless of where people are coming, when you've new people coming into a place, there is a demand side story that happens um, that is going to lead to economic growth and more job creation in the long run. That's the that's the story I think that needs to be told, right? Is that we have potential to grow to together, right? To create jobs for each other, to pick each other up, um, rather than there's not a fixed number of jobs to be taken, right? And I think with, if going back to the public goods story is we also don't have a fixed amount of public goods. We get to choose, mm -hmm. right? We get to choose how much money we spend on roads. We get to choose how much money we invest in schools. We can decide to hire another public school teacher, right? Those are all choices that we can make um, that could lead to greater economic growth and stability. And, and not just like economic growth in the GDP sense, but we could, could to actually get to um, a better society, right? A better a society where people are, are happier and, and their health is higher and they're better taken care of, right? Um, and so I think that that's the, the potential to see the way in which we can all grow together is what I would like, like to see in terms of policy futures. Um, we can have also like a whole other conversation about the ways in which we should or shouldn't be worrying about the deficit. I argue we should not be worrying about the deficit. Um, okay, but so, I don't yeah. so yeah, let me let me step in here. So yeah, tell. so that's another major issue in uh, America, the rising deficit, and especially one of the arguments presented to uh, against expansion of public goods uh, is that the deficit is rising too quickly and the government's source of revenue is steady, right? Or it's not increasing. Yeah. And no major political party is uh, willing to raise taxes, right? I mean, that's it seems like a consensus that raising taxes is not an option. So the only policy solution is cutting spending because yeah. of to, to address deficit. But what you are saying, expanding public goods may lead to rise in deficit. So how would you defend that? Yeah. So our colleague, <laughs> Yevon Ersissian, um, works a lot on modern monetary theory. And she, I think she explains this very well. I will try to explain the way she does. But one of the things when we talk about a deficit, um, a lot of times people think about that in like a personal accounting sense of like how much money you as your household has or you as an individual has. But in the government sen sense, a deficit on the side of the government means a surplus on the side of um, households and people and businesses in the country, right? So that means that that's actually money that has gone out and is an injection in the economy and has the opportunity to create growth and have um, linkages with the rest of the economy. The constraint, right, that the real constraint is not our deficit, is not our debt, um, but is inflation. Like, And we've seen that, right? We've seen that in the last couple of years. Inflation is a real concern. It's not a thing that we can completely ignore. When this government when government money, right, and government spending is put into the economy in the real, in a real sense, and I mean, um, into production capacity. So in, like, this is why I like, am a big supporter of the Green New Deal is like, we could change a lot of our infrastructure to be more envir environmentally friendly. That is real work that needs to be done um, that has real productive capacity for our economy. If we put money into things like that, that is much less likely to lead to inflation than just giving people checks, right? Um, and so thinking about ways in which government money is used as a form of investment in the economy, we're much less likely to see the inflation effects um, and, and has a ton of growth potential out of that. Makes sense. So now coming back to the, the discussion of public goods and the, the race angle in the US. So expansion of public goods, if we can convince every American, especially white working class Americans, that expansion of public goods is going to benefit them as well as other Americans, including people of color, that seems like a win-win for everyone, but it's it's not a zero-sum game, but yeah. it has been framed as a zero-sum game. 
as as you mentioned how can we get out of this zero sum game is it possible do you foresee happening anytime soon i think for there's like this individual storytelling thing that can happen right around um folks that have seen the benefits the the benefits of when particular towns or cities make choices to have public investments or to not let themselves be divided along along lines of race. But I also think it's a big part of our rhetoric, right? So it matters in terms of how we talk about it. And it's like one of the things, at least in my class, in my classrooms, that I really try to get people to push back against this. I, I think just like the notion of having a fixed quantity of anything is like where we need to move away from. They're not a fixed, like this, there's not a fixed number of jobs. <laughs> there's not a fixed number of public goods, right? And so one once we get away from that, it enab- enables us to get out of this kind of accounting framework in our heads. If someone takes something, that means I can't have it. That that's not that's not also the way public goods work either, right? They're non-rival. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Um, so we yeah we are living in one of the richest countries ever in the world, right? So there's enough to go around. It's more like a question of distribution that needs. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, Leanne, for your time. Uh, it was wonderful speaking with you. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. Until next time, this is Danish Khan signing off from Fiscal Focus. <laughs>